Good morning. Good morning, Rabbi Welcome to Breakfast on the Class. Breakfast on the Class today and learning for this week is dedicated by the Torah Center, uh, Gold Donors, the Dishi Brothers, as a zechut for the Chayalim and for their continued protection of Am Yisrael. This entire year of Breakfast on the Class is dedicated in loving memory of Yishpat Rut, Bat Adela or Fali, Aleha Shalom, sponsored by our family. Just uh, again a shout out, what an amazing idea this was. The year of, uh, of that someone passed away, they did the entire year that every single morning uh, their, their grandma is mentioned in the class. All is what a tremendous zechut. Uh, uh, and finally, breakfast and the class today, which is deluxe, not the class, the class is regular. But the breakfast is deluxe, <laughs> is dedicated in honor of Joshua and Vivian Sit, uh, Yehoshua and Chaya, in celebration of the birth of their daughter, Batya, Mazal Tov, and Mabruk. Fantastic. What are you going to call her? Are you going to call her Batya? We don't know. You don't know. You're going to do this. Betty yeah, okay. Betty or Batya. Okay. L'chaim uh, to whatever it is. Please only answer amen if you're listening to this live. Baruch Atah Adonai. Elohim Melech HaOlam Sha'akul Yen Baruch. Fantastic coffee. All right, let's go. So, I want to draw your attention to a couple interesting uh, questions um, that hopefully will give us an interesting idea into what it is that a person can do to solve one of the challenges that human beings have. And um, I, I hope that this is something that will have an impact on you like it had on me. The Torah tells us that when, uh, that when Eliezer arrives, he tells the family of Rivka, he says, listen, you know, I had kfitzat derech. I came here very, very quickly. And then Eliezer, what does he do? He tells him, not only did I come here very quickly, he prays and prays and prays to Hashem, that Hashem should make his mission successful, and he should be able to bring back Rivka, a wife for Yitzchak. And then he gives her jewelry. He doesn't even know who she is yet. Now why does he do that? Remember, if she was not eligible, did Avraham make this condition with Eliezer? That he should pray in the first person? No, Eliezer made that up, right? So why is it that Eliezer is giving her these, all the jewelry, if it turns out that she's not the right person, all that jewelry, you know, there's no backseas. It's not like a, you know, return on the swanny. What are you talking about? So Eliezer would have had to pay back Avraham from his own money if he gave that, those, that jewelry away and it, when she wasn't from the right family. Not only that, we have one more question. When Eliezer gets to the family, um, what's it called? The pasuk, the pasuk says, they said, listen, she's very young. Let her stay here. Yamim, or I saw her for two days or for ten days. According to another opinion, for two years or for ten years, right? Let her stay when she's ready. We'll send her for the, to get Joazd, you know? What's the, what, what's the rush? Eliezer is like, no, she's got to come right now. What is going on with Eliezer? And the Chachamim give us uh, a beautiful insight. And it tells as follows. Eliezer desperately wanted Yitzchak to marry his daughter. Avraham would not do so because she was from Canaan. Right? And therefore he was not interested in the Shiduch. But really Eliezer wanted Yitzchak to marry his daughter. There's a challenge in this life when a person is supposed to be doing one thing, A, whatever that is, but they have quite literally what's called a conflict of interests. I'm supposed to be doing A, but I don't want to do A. I want to do B. B benefits me more. Someone comes up to me and they tell me, listen, you know, I have an apartment. I want to sell the apartment. You know, maybe would you uh, approach this guy you know, to, to, in the shul, I know he's looking. Maybe you could connect me and him and we'll do the sale. Now imagine you, you're a, you're a real estate broker. You say, listen, if I, if I introduce the guy here in shul like this, you know, maybe I don't make my commission. It's in my benefit, my interest, to not make the introduction here, but to wait till I get back to the office 
and send them an email and say, listen, you know, I was thinking about it. I might have some people, you know, would you like me to share the information? Now you have an email that says that the guy he told you to show it to some people. And now if you sell the apartment, you get your commission. So it's not in your interest to do what the guy told you you're going to do. Now, that's a simple example. But there's a million such examples. When it comes to people's personal life, when it comes to people's, uh, you know, uh, financial interests. So what is a person supposed to do when A, they're being asked to do A, and really they want to do B? But, let me take it one step further, that's just when a random guy asks you to do something. What happens when the person who's asking you to do A is none other than Borei Olam? What's a person supposed to do when that which God asks you is contrary to your interests, to what you want to do? You should really give in. You should really forgive. You should really let the other guy have the money. You should really not encroach on this guy's business, even though you have an unbelievable opportunity. He was there first, and there's not enough room for the both of you. Right? This guy is already dealing with the house. He can't afford another house. I don't know if you know this. There's a very interesting law called Ani Mehapech Bacharara. Anyone know what that means? Ani, it means a poor person. Mehapech, he's uh, turning over, he's flipping over. Bacharara, what does that mean? It doesn't mean in uh, poop. <laughs> it means he finds in the garbage, he finds a cookie, a piece of bread, a piece of something. So the guy is now looking at the guy, he finds this item. And now you're going to scoop in and take it from him. If he's working in it, and he found it, and he's going to take it, and this is what he's been dealing with. And he, you know, so by the way, there's some conditions to this. But either way, this law applies not only in a garbage, with a, when a guy's trying to find something. Let's say a guy finds a deal, and he's working the deal, and he's right there. I could swoop in and take the deal. Let's say a guy finds a piece of property, he could buy this piece of property. I swoop in, I, I think I'm paying more. What's the problem? I'm paying more. Halakha says, if this guy is a poor person, he can't afford, if you buy this property, he can't buy another one. This is the only one he could buy. That's called anima pech b'charara. Now what if you're also poor, a lot of conditions that have to fall into place in order for this to be the halakha, right? Another halakha, a guy has a house. Next door to the house, a house goes for sale. You know what that's called? Dina de bar metra. The law of the person bar metra. That doesn't mean the law of the person who's Egyptian. It means the person who is the neighbor. For him, the value of that property is much bigger because he's already got the property next to it. For you, it's just a property. Why should you take the property that means much more to him than it would mean to you? He could now make a bigger house. He could have a house and a field for an orchard to have his business. So he gets first dibs on the buy. Again, lots of laws involved in the case, but that's called Dina de Bar Metra. Now, I, I want to buy the property. I see opportunity upside. Now, now the rabbi is telling me this. I don't want to do it. I'm looking for every loophole in the book because I don't want to do it. What do you do? when your interest runs counter to the mitzvah. Eliezer didn't only have a commandment from Avraham Avinu. Avraham telling him as his master, please go find me a shiduch. But if you remember, what else did he do? Huh? What else did Eliezer do besides for just get commanded by Avraham? He swore. Avraham asked Eliezer, swear to me. Right? Sim Place your hand by my brit milah. It's a mitzvah. Make an oath to Hashem that you're going to go and you're going to try and find a daughter, uh, a woman for my wife who's not Canaanite. So Eliezer made a shibua to God himself. But he doesn't want to do it. What's a person supposed to do? The answer is all found in the story of Eliezer. Eliezer doesn't want to do it. So what does he do? He knows that Avraham is at home praying that Yitzchak should get a shiduch. He knows that. How come Eliezer is praying? The answer is because what Avraham is praying for and what Eliezer is praying for is not the same thing. 
Avram's praying for his son to get married. Eliezer is praying that he should be able to fulfill this mitzvah that he really does not want to do. So Eliezer says, listen, if I sit around here looking for all the G's, the right one, I might, I might chicken out. If, it, if I don't get there quickly, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to get in my own head. You know when I need to do the mitzvah? I need to do it this second. So when they tell him, oh, let's wait a few days, is like, no, can't wait. A guy comes to you, he's annoying you for tzedakah. You don't want to give him. You know what the best way to give him is? To give him before you could say no. The deal comes on the table. You sign on the thing that you're not going to take the, before you get a chance. Because you know what time gives you? Time gives you the opportunity for many rationalizations. You could explain it away like this or like that. You could find reasons why the guy really owes you the money. You could find, you'll go to the ends of the earth to do what you already want to do and you won't even realize it. So what does Eliezer do? Rambam says, that if a person has a bad midah, let's say they're prone to losing their temper. So if you want to fix a bad midah, you're bent all the way, one way, says uh, Rambam, okay? You take uh, an object and you bend it all the way one way. Here, Shuf, I'll show you in the little video. Yeah, see how paper's bent all the way that way? If I just put it back now to the middle, you know what happens? It just falls back. The only way to straighten that bend that piece of paper is to bend it all the way in the exact opposite 180 degrees if you bend it in exact opposite direction and then you make it straight now the paper has no reason to go one way or another you understand so Rambam says when a person finds themselves pushing in one direction Especially when they know that that direction is not the right one. And the reason why they're doing it is because they're angry, or they're jealous, or they're bitter, or they desire, or whatever the case might be. You know what the answer is? You go hard all the way, so that you can go home. You bend exactly the opposite direction. Eliezer gives Rivka. He sees the signs, this girl might be the one. He's giving her jewelry already. You know what, if I have to pay for it, I'll pay for it. But I know that this is the way I'm going to do the mitzvah. My friends, a lot of times, jumping the gun might mean that you made a little bit of a mistake. But you know what Eliezer says, I'd rather pay the price and do the right thing. You're going to speak Lashon Ara. You think to yourself, oh, it's not the right thing, I shouldn't speak Lashon Ara. You know what, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. That's not enough. You leave that group right there. They're all talking about someone. You walk away. You know why? Because if you waited Yom Yamim or Asor, you waited two days or ten days, you know what happens? The conversation comes back around and then someone says, you know, this guy, what a Adami guy. What a special person he is. This guy is amazing. He's so good. He's so nice. You say, okay, one second. Now I can't handle no more. He's nice. Let me tell you what happened with me. You were going to keep your mouth shut. You can't do it anymore. Yamim or Asor. When we look at the parasha, we look at Eliezer, we see a person who's struggling with a problem. And what does he do by re to respond to that problem? He brings an atom bomb to, f to swat a fly. When we know in ourselves that we have this leaning, a leaning towards impatience, the answer is not to be patient like a regular person. The answer is to bring in patience that is so far beyond. Not like New York City patients, like Los Angeles patients. Anyone here from New York ever go to Los Angeles? Anyone ever go? You ever go to Minnesota? You want to kill yourself. <laughs> I'm sitting there in the line to get a bagel. I'm already, I have indigestion. I'm already stressed out. Why, this person is sitting there. What are you going to have? I think I'm going to have a, yeah, I'm going to go with a flaxseed, uh, Everything, no, don't do the flaxseed. Do the alfalfa flour. If you did that in New York, you'd get shot. Right? If you walk up to the counter and you don't already know what you want, next! We're in Minnesota, we pull up to a four way stop sign. My friends, if you ever want to see time in the universe, stop, go to Minnesota, get to a four way stop sign. 
Everyone is like, Bechavot, 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 Bechavot. No one goes anywhere. You know what they call it? Minnesota nice. If you're a New Yorker and you're a horrible person. <laughs> okay? You have no patience for nobody. What's the antidote? The antidote is not a little bit of patience. The antidote is to OD on patience. If you're a person who gets angry and you want to fix that, you have an anger issue, you need to get to a place where even things that should get you angry don't get you angry. Not forever, but long enough to be able to flip that proclivity, to be able to flip that uh, tendency into, into another lane. My friends, I'll end with this. The Chachamin tell us in the Gemara, Yafe si chatan shel avde avot Right? Look at how much the Torah values the speech of the servants of the Avot. Even more than Torah Tan Shel Banim. Even more than the Torah of their children. Do you get that? Look how precious the servants of the Avot were that the Torah gives us 20 pages of Eliezer telling over the story. We just read the story. Eliezer then tells it over again. The Torah thinks it's important enough to repeat the whole story. Yafesi Chatan. Wow. Even more than Torah Tan Shabani. I saw a magnificent idea. Niflaotecha Asicha. He brings down, he says, you know why the, the prattle, the idle chatter of the servants of the Avot was even more important than Torah Tan Shabanim. Why? Because Hen Hen Gufe Torah. Because the point of the entire Torah is the calibration of a person's midot. The point of all of the mitzvot is to change a person's character traits from negative to net positive. So therefore, when Eliezer is telling you all these things, that looking at it with the right eyes, you realize are ways to change human behavioral patterns, tell me more. Eliezer, you could talk all day. You know why? Because that's why a human being comes to this world. The Rabbi Yisrael Salanta wrote that if a person is not working on changing their midot, lama lo chayim. Why, why is he even alive? We are alive to change, but not just to change and grow and do more. A lot of times, a person has an anger issue. A person has an issue of being a narcissist. A person has an issue of being a, a lack of trust. So you know what they do? Brilliant. They cover up their fundamental flaw with lots of beautiful flowers. Now imagine, I don't know if you ever go into a bathroom and you see, I did not understand what this was for a long time. I walk into a bathroom, I got back from England. They weren't doing this when I left to England. I get back from England, there's a little item over there in this, next to the sink, and it's got a bunch of sticks coming out of it. In my life, I never saw, I'm trying to think, what is the purpose of these sticks in the bathroom? <laughs> I wasn't sure how they are used in the, in the process of the tesh. I wasn't exactly <laughs> understanding, right? It's a, like a, what do they call it? A diffuser, okay? A diffuser, fantastic. So I'm looking at this diffuser, I'm trying to understand what it is. It looks like from when I was a kid, we used to light punks. Anyone remember that? Oh, yep. that, that little stick with a long thing. They would put it so the mosquitoes wouldn't come. That's what I thought. Then I thought maybe it's sparklers. I don't know, in case someone goes to the tesh <laughs> on his birthday, they like, I don't know. I was not sure what it was. But it was this, the smell of shamai, unbelievable. And I was thinking to myself, I'm not really sure. Like, is a bathroom a place that should smell like vanilla? I don't know why I need to be smelling cookies. I don't know why, you know, it's a strange thing. But my friends, you know what happens? After the bathroom, the reason why it's there is because it's a bad smell. So what do we do? You have a good smell. But in the end, what happens? You don't have a good smell. You just have terrible smell with notes of vanilla. You need an extractor fan, not more. No one is walking into a terribly smelling bathroom and saying, you know what we need? Orange and nutmeg. That's not what you need. You need to get rid of the terrible smell. A human being is like that. There's something about your character and it stinks. And you were put here on this earth to be able to fix that. That's your mission here on earth. But what do people do? They cover it with flowers. So I'm a person 
who is dishonest in business, you know what my answer is? Cover it with flowers, give a lot of sadaqah. Bring that to, you know. Uh, what's it called? I'm a person who's violent, who screams, who's angry. You know what? Cover it with some other mitzvah. You know, give a Torah class. <laughs> Anything that you could do not to do the thing that you're supposed to do. Anyone have that? You know you need to get to the office and there's one important thing you have to do and you don't want to do it. You have to send an email, terrible email, firing somebody, letting go of a deal, oh, it's terrible. Update the investors. There's one thing you come into the office, you don't want to do it. You know what you'll find all of a sudden you get into the office? There's nine trillion other things that you get busy with. You start fixing your desk. You know, you're taking care of those other things. You'll procrastinate with everything but that thing. You know what? I don't want to do it. You know what Eliezer says? You have that thing that you need to do. You know when you should do it. The first thing when you first walk in the office, before you do anything else, answer any email, make any phone call, do the thing that you need to do right now. You know what? Because there's never going to be a good time for it. So Eliezer says, I don't want to do this. Let me get there faster. We want to delay it two days so she could be, get her stuff together. We're leaving today. What if she needs clothes? No problem. We'll go buy a new clothes in the city. That is how a person addresses their faults. Not by hiding from them, not by disguising them, not by doing anything else, but by addressing them head on and going so hard the other way that you break the midah. May Hashem bless us to be able to be honest with ourselves, to change in the ways that we truly need to change. Yafesi chatan, that's why the idle chatter of Eliezer is worth more than Toratan Shel Banim. You know why? Because the purpose of Toratan Shel Banim is the, uh, is the rectification, is the refinement of a person's character traits that they need to fix. Baruch Amen v'amen. Rabbi Charanya.